I think the main reason why Rings of Power was such a disaster of a show is not what people are saying it is. Yes, the show was slowly paced, the dialogue was stiff and awkward, and of course the lore was disrespected. All of those things matter. But I disagree with the people saying they're the main reasons why this show flopped. Instead, I think the real reason why is because they failed to get us to care about their characters. The entire cast of Rings of Power, with some small concessions, is really quite boring. We can't relate to them, we don't care if they succeed or fail. In fact, so many people were so apathetic as to whether or not these people live or die. I've never seen so many people say they've been rooting so hard for a villain to win the story. You can tell the showrunners failed miserably in this respect, because again and again the show is coaxing you into caring. Oh no! Lenny Henry just got stabbed, and we hear the music swell, and he says these dramatic final words about seeing the sunrise one last time, and you, the viewer, just feel… empty. And you watch dead-faced, and you're definitely not crying, because for some reason you just don't give a damn if this guy dies or not. We need to be invested before you can pull off payoffs like this. That is a truth that the showrunners seem to be oblivious of, and they showcase that many dozens of times throughout the rings of power. The one shining light in this, the one time they got things right in the character department and actually spent time fleshing things out, was the friendship between Elrond and Durin, and it just so happened that for many people, their friendship was the highlight of the whole show. The point I'm making, and why I firmly believe it's the character front that's the most damning failing here, is the importance of different elements of a story, pace, character, world building, they vary tremendously based on the kind of story you're telling. You simply don't need great characters for short stories to be good ones, uh, shows like Love, Death and Robots prove that one in spades. However, if you're telling a long story such as an epic fantasy TV show like House of the Dragon or Rings of Power, you will find that your audience can endure the occasional shoddy subplot or shaky world building. I've seen that happen lots of times. What the audience can't endure are bad characters. Ones who are borderline Mary Sue's like Galadriel. And who's his face? Who's the sailor? And what's his face? The elven archer whose name for the life of me I can't remember, but let's be fair, you can't remember this guy's name either, can you? Um, when you're making a TV show with an overarching story, it's the characters we've fallen in love with, the ones we fear the worst might happen to and hope the best for. I think that's the thing above all else that keeps a fandom engaged in the long term, wanting to come back for episode after episode, new season after new season. Instead of trying to achieve that, this show puts a great deal of effort into building these J.J. Abrams style mystery boxes. What's in this mysterious glowy box? Who is this strange woman? Who is Sauron? Is this guy Sauron? Is he? Or is he? This is a mistake that Amazon has made twice now. They did it by building this big mystery of who is the dragon reborn in the Wheel of Time, a mystery that the original books did not have whatsoever, and they made this mistake again with the Rings of Power. These showrunners are falling for a storytelling trap that good writers have been fully aware of for decades now. There's a reason why in Pulp Fiction, Tarantino never let us know what was in the briefcase. Because these sorts of mystery boxes, sure they can be cool and make for fun reveals, they're also never the main reason why we stay invested in a story. In fact, Tarantino poked fun at the audience's expectations here by never letting us know the contents of this mystery box, and it still makes for a great film nonetheless. Pardon my French, but if you do any long form story, it doesn't matter how many billions you sink into it, if nobody gets invested in your characters, your show is fucked. <laughs> um, and where better to break it down than by looking at Galadriel, the person who's practically the protagonist of the Rings of Power, and a character that totally failed to resonate with her audience. 
The truth is, many are complaining that Galadriel is simply too unlikable, but I don't think this is as much of a problem as people are saying it is. Because you don't need a character to be likable in order for us to be compelled by them. Think Daniel Plainview, Walter White, Jordan Belfort, or Derek from American History X. I'm not saying that Galadriel should have been this kind of character, but I'm pointing out that unlikability is not a damning trait for a protagonist to have, as those very well received prior examples do prove. What I absolutely would say is a problem is when there's a dissonance between what the creators set out to do and what they actually achieved. Like all of those aforementioned characters, the creators knew full well they were writing unlikable assholes, and they had no illusions about it, playing into their unlikability with intention. This is pure speculation from me, I don't exactly have any evidence backing this up, but I don't think the same can be said for the Rings of Power, because they seem to be out to make this Sarah Connor-esque, badass female soldier, but fell flat on their faces and ended up creating an intensely unlikable person who doesn't have anything redeeming about her. Y you know, except for the fact she's really, really good with a sword and can swim better than Michael Phelps, neither of which, however, can be called personality traits. It's really quite interesting with all of those unlikable characters I mentioned, how every last one of them gets their comeuppance in the end, betraying I think that deep down we follow these hateful protagonists because we want to see them crash and burn. We love it when these characters get their comeuppance. Uh, this definitely didn't happen to Galadriel. In fact, she's a brash, violent, unsympathetic dick who is a really quite nasty person to most people she meets, yet everyone she meets comes to really like her in in the end, except for this one guy right here, but then again he is a bigot who is racist against elves. Like Even Sauron, the Dark Lord, comes to really quite like Galadriel in the end, offering her a place by his side. I do hate to say it, but Galadriel is really ticking off a dangerous number of boxes on the Mary Sue checklist. And also before we crack on to the next bit, there are quite a few kinds of videos that don't fit well here on YouTube. Videos I'd love to make, but can't because they're the sort the algorithm suppresses. In fact, this is such a big problem that me and hundreds of other creators have come together to build a new site called Nebula. Uh, and if you go there, you'll find an exclusive video essay by me on world building in video games, and why game makers have an unfair advantage over movie makers when it comes to building a gripping world. Hello Future Me's also got a Nebula exclusive series on becoming a better writer, and Lindsay Ellis just returned from her hiatus and released a 50 minute breakdown of the Lord of the Rings movies, and how loyal they actually are as adaptations, which is very relevant to this video's topic. Like all of those videos I just mentioned, and many more exclusives, you can watch them right now on Nebula. There you'll get no ads whatsoever, exclusive videos, be directly supporting me in making more of these videos, and what really sweetens the deal here is how we've partnered up with CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video, who have thousands of high quality documentaries, some narrated by David Attenborough which I really enjoyed, and we're doing a two for one subscription. It means if you click my link in the description, you'll get both of these streaming sites for the price of one, meaning it's $14.79 a year for both. This price is so low for the value you're getting out of it, it's ridiculous. And if all of this sounds good to you, do click my link in the description and join up today. Uh, with CuriosityStream, I'd recommend you start off with Sherlock Holmes against Conan Doyle. It's a breakdown of how the iconic character was created and I found this documentary really quite fascinating, and with Nebula, I'd recommend that aside from my video of course, you check out Lindsay Ellis's new essay on Lord of the Rings, as she did a great job breaking down how well and poorly Peter Jackson actually adapted the original books. Again, if all of this sounds good to you, do click that link in the description and get these two great streaming services today. Anyway, back to it. Uh, with Galadriel, it seems the creators were out to make a compelling protagonist. It just so happens that they failed in this regard. Um, how could they have done better then? The thing is, is if you go around and ask like any halfway decent writer, they could easily rattle off 10 different ways you can make any character compelling. You can give them a highly relatable motivation, a compelling character arc. You can give them a relationship they have with another character in which we get invested. Um, Sam's and Frodo's relationship in the original trilogy is a perfect example of this. Uh, you could give them an old wound they got before the story kicked off, and they're really 
struggling with managing this internal wound of theirs throughout the whole story. There are lots of ways you can get us to care. It just so happens that out of the many techniques that exist, they employed exactly none of them with Galadriel. Firstly, what is the most essential thing to get right with any character? Well, it's their motivation, of course, and let's look at hers in the Rings of Power. Galadriel has spent the past hundred years and the entire series out to hunt down Sauron. But here's a good question, why does Galadriel want to stop him? Go on, why? What is her reason? It's never actually established. In episode 1, it's said that her brother died in the big war with Morgoth, but while this could be good enough if written a tad differently, in the show as it stands, it is not, because her brother was killed by orcs under the command of Morgoth. Sauron was only very tangentially related to his death. It's not like Sauron killed the dude with his bare hands or anything, but sure, this is a way of letting us know this all taught Galadriel a lesson. It means she knows how dangerous orcs can be and fully respects how much of a threat they and all of these dark lords are. Fair enough, that's firmly established. But again, this comes back to that same old question, why does Galadriel want to defeat Sauron? Reading between the lines, the answer seems to be that she doesn't like evil very much and wants to stop the forces of evil because evil is bad. But the thing is, while that is a motivation that makes a sort of sense, it at the very least prevents her from feeling like she has no reason at all for doing what she does. It's nowhere near enough to tug on our heartstrings and get us to really want her to succeed, to relate to her. Uh, give me one minute and I'll flesh this out and think of something slightly better. I hear in the lore Galadriel had a husband and a daughter at the time this show takes place, which is something that this show entirely ignored. Well, why not just add that into her character? Uh, have it so, in episode 1, we have a flashback to Galadriel on the battlefield against Morgoth. It's horrible and very traumatising. Then jump to the second age where she's now got a husband and a daughter. She wakes up one night, still struggling with nightmares of a war that even after hundreds of years have not gone away, but we see her being truly happy with her husband and daughter, both of whom she loves deeply. Ah, oh, isn't that nice? Very nice, very sweet. Then wham, a, a tiny clue, a tangible clue that Sauron is alive, reaches Galadriel. Perhaps a long lost relic once known to belong to Sauron, or a peasant is brought to the elves saying his village was ransacked by orcs, all of whom wore the mark of Sauron. It could be anything. But after this, she goes up to the elven leaders and says, guys, no one ever conclusively killed Sauron, and these clues mean that Sauron simply must be alive, gathering his strength. We've got to find him and strike now before we have another war on our hands. And the Big King is all like, yeah, it's, it's possible he's still around, but this isn't enough to go on. We'll just wait for more information corroborating his existence, but we'll do something then. But until then, we're sitting on our backsides and doing absolutely bugger all. Uh, then Galadriel goes back to her family and sees her daughter fr frolicking about or something. And it's when she sees her daughter and has a sort of mini flashback to, again, that horrible war with Morgoth. That's what compels her to defy her king and hunt Sauron for one simple reason. Because the war against Morgoth was the single most horrendous thing she has ever gone through, and she wants to ensure that her daughter never has to go through the same horrors she did. Like, oh my god, like her character is now way more compelling than she used to be, because we've actually given her a relatable, fleshed out motivation. And again, this is a fairly simple change that could have been implemented and we could have still kept the same overall plot and story. The truth is, any decent writer knows the importance of giving the protagonist something they care deeply about, because when you do that, it makes us care too. Galadriel in the show just wanting to stop Sauron for the vaguely alluded reasons of evil bad, therefore evil must be stopped, while making a sort of sense, is simply not enough to get us to care. Imagine if we saw John Wick out to kill a guy, but we had no clue why. Sure, the fight scenes would still look cool, but we aren't engaged with the story. But suddenly, if you start the story with said guy killing John's dog, justifying your revenge quest, suddenly we care a ton. 
This really is a writing cheat code, and it's a surprisingly effective one. Give a character something they care deeply about, then have the thing they care about being threatened in some way, justifying the journey they take in the story. It's a very quick and easy way to get the audience invested in a character's journey. But in fairness, Galadriel is not a textbook Mary Sue. She's not, because there are some Mary Sue criteria that she doesn't tick off. In Episode 5, for example, Galadriel is finally given an amount of character depth when this happens. Why do you keep fighting? Because I cannot stop. The company I led mutinied against me. My closest friend conspired with the king to exile me, and each of them acted as they did, because I believed they could no longer distinguish me from the evil I was fighting. Hey, finally! Galadriel finally has a degree of depth to her. It only took us five episodes. The story is already 63% over by this point, but at least it's something. Uh, basically, she's been irreparably damaged by war, so much so she's as evil as the foe she fights. Alright, gotcha. This feels closely related to uh, something many soldiers all over the world struggle with. It's easy to turn a civilian into a soldier, but how do you turn a soldier back into a civilian. Some veterans really struggle with that. Many of them turn into dark, cynical bastards after doing and witnessing many horrendous things. This is now a thing the writers can work with to really flesh her out and make her a compelling character in the remaining episodes. There's only three of them, mind you, so we've got to make them count. Will we see her have PTSD from hundreds of years of feral warfare like many veterans do? And this PTSD means she's irritable and is incapable of getting a good night's sleep? No? Uh, okay. Um, will we have her? Um, maybe she's got a crush on someone, but she's terrified of taking the first step of even saying hello because she's afraid she'd never be able to adapt to the civilian way of life and be the partner she feels her love interest deserves. Play that right, and that could really tug on people's heartstrings. And, uh, uh, oh... Oh, the show doesn't do that one either. Um, as it turns out, aside from a single speech she gives to a captive bad guy in episode 6, this wound of hers, this supposed wound of hers, never manifests in the story in any meaningful way. That is simply not good writing. Never throw ideas like this into your story, then do practically nothing to explore them. But all right, uh, it's never about the idea, it's all about the execution. So how can we take that very idea they introduced and do a better execution of it? Well, um, what if in episode one, she's invited to an elven party after coming back from her big expedition? But when she begrudgingly arrives, she's so stiff, is so worked up and is so easily on edge that no one is enjoying her company and she's not enjoying theirs. Then Elrond sees her old pal Galadriel, who they were great friends with before the war. So he sneaks up on her to put his hand over her eyes or something and to do something playful. Uh, but when she hears him coming, she grabs him by the collar, throws him to the ground, and puts a dagger to his throat, giving the most evil snarl on her face as every other elf in the party just looks at her with horror. And then Galadriel sees the fear in Elrond's face, has a moment of horrible self-realization, seeing herself for the monster she is. So she drops the knife and runs away, barely holding her composure, cringing from all of the embarrassment. Like, that sounds like a fairly fun scene. But did we get that? Or anything even remotely close to that? No, we didn't get that one either. I don't know about you, but what do you feel be the most compelling way to demonstrate that Galadriel is struggling with this wound? Doing that scene I just suggested in episode one, or having her verbally just say it aloud in episode five? Which one would be the best way to execute this? Good writers never have characters verbally say these things. That is the laziest way to do it. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. Good writers will instead let this terrible flaw or wound of theirs be highly relevant time and time again throughout the entire story from start to end. They'll have it demonstrated so well, explored so thoroughly, that there is never a need to give this on-the-nose exposition, because by merely seeing the characters struggling and suffering through their daily life, we can tell very clearly what ails them. 
Gladriel is also super boring because she is very much one note, meaning she is always tenacious. She never has a dark night of the soul where her wants and beliefs as a person are truly tested. Like, uh, granted, she is sent on that ship to the Undying Lands and then she nopes on out at the last second, but I'd argue her internal struggle wasn't fleshed out well enough in that scene to render her a great character in it. And that, from what I can tell, is the only moment in the entire show where her faiths and wants and beliefs are challenged in any kind of way. Even in the end, when Sauron gives her the cliché villain speech of Join me, and together we shall rule the galaxy! Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, join me, and together we shall rule Middle-earth! She is never seriously tempted, and immediately, adamantly, tells him to bugger off. And sure, this is a choice that is consistent with her character, but rejecting the Dark Lord's offer is also a very boring thing for a fantasy protagonist to do. It plays right into the cliche. One of these days we're going to get a story where the villain says the, the old join me speech and then the hero actually says, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, sounds like a good idea, actually. And then he joins the villain's side. Like, one day, I we'll get the story that breaks that cliche. I look forward to seeing it. But another reason why we just don't care about her is how there is no real internal struggle going on. She doesn't have anything that could conceivably be called an arc. Now, I'd never say a protagonist must have an arc, otherwise they'll be boring. But when you're writing a protagonist, you've got to give us a reason to want to carry on watching them. A reason to care. This can be them having an arc or anything else. We just need a reason. They just so happen to never give us one with Galadriel. There's also another problem that's loosely related to this on why we just don't give much of a damn about Galadriel's character. Because how can we be invested in a person who makes absolutely nonsensical choices that completely go against the motivation she seemingly has? Look at me, I'm Galadriel. I will scour every corner of Middle-earth and do so for hundreds of years in the name of finding Sauron and killing him. I will even leave my own squad mates behind to die because I loathe Sauron just that much. Two weeks later. What's this? I know who Sauron is. He's been under my nose this entire time, and worse, he's been whispering at Celebrimbor's ear, corrupting the magical artifacts upon which the fate of my entire species rests. Celebrimbor hasn't yet made the rings too, so if I let him know now that Sauron manipulated him, that he actually wanted him to make these rings in the way he's about to, we can stop the process immediately and carefully study them and figure out how exactly Sauron corrupted them, how we can reverse his corruption, and we can also deduce what his grand and plan is, and then we can use that knowledge to defeat Sauron once and for all. But nah, let's not bother. I'm no grass. And why am I not letting Celebrimbor know this incredibly vital information? Oh, oh uh, ooh, because reason. And also, seeing as I just learned this dude is Sauron, should I let the king know so we can summon a force and hunt Sauron down and kill him as he leaves the city? Nah, like James Norrington at the end of Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm gonna say... Well, I think we can afford to give him one day's head start. And sit back, allowing Sauron's escape. Why am I doing that to my arch enemy? Because, oh... Oh, reasons, I, I guess? <laughs> I, I cannot for the life of me think of a more basic writing mistake. When you give a character a motivation, make sure everything they do lines up with that motivation. Or annoying, cynical British YouTubers will rub it in your face for people's amusement. Uh, enough said. But let's look at Elrond. And while he is not as bad as Galadriel, I'd argue that he's still not a very well-written character. I think the guy's performance was actually quite good, honestly. The actor couldn't have done a better job, it's just a shame he was given so little to work with. Now, as I said earlier, his relationship with Durin, it really is one of the strong points of the show. It's one of the very few times the show did things right. Lots of people cared about their relationship, and that's for several reasons.
reasons. Firstly, they're very basic, but these two characters truly care about one another, and the degree to which they care for each other is fully explored and depicted in the show. We never see Galadriel care about anyone or anything. She just about tolerates Halbrand's existence as he plods along beside her, but that's really it for her. Their relationship also has conflict and progression. They start off very hostile. Durin is rightfully angsty at Elrond for neglecting him for a good 20 years of his life, and then they grow more friendly as their wounds heal. While it's pretty hard to disagree with the statement that this right here is the best written part of the show, nonetheless, Elrond's character was still not as engaging as he really should have been, I reckon. From what I can tell, Elrond's character sort of falls flat for three different reasons. Firstly, his motivations aren't fleshed out enough. Secondly, he doesn't struggle enough. And thirdly, he hardly has any flaws. Now, let's break down why. Firstly, Elrond has practically no character flaws. He's wise, he's clever, he's great at smashing rocks. He's more or less a perfect man, where the only thing he does that's indicative of a character flaw is how he neglected his old friend Durin for many years. This hints at the idea that Elrond has poor empathy for those around him, although even that was poorly fleshed out and never fully realised as a flaw of his. The show says he neglected Durin for many years, but it also never actually lets us know precisely why he did that, and that's a missed opportunity for juicy character development if I've ever seen one. And I appreciate that elves have lived for many thousands of years, so have had a lot of time to do self-improvement. Uh, nonetheless, I really do think that that's a cop-out to this problem, because storytelling is all about characters overcoming flaws and their internal demons. You deprive a character of any negative quirks, congratulations, now they're ever so slightly more boring as a character. And I'm just going to say it, just because a character is an elf, that doesn't mean they must be boring. Secondly, he doesn't struggle enough, and as an aside, he's also fairly passive as a character too. With the three exceptions of him struggling to beat Durin in a rock-smashing contest, when Durin shouts at him in a couple scenes, and when Durin's father finds the mining and shuts the operation down, with those notable exceptions, Elrond never struggles in this eight-hour long story. There's no real suspense around what he's doing, no real tension, hardly any conflict around his plot, or at the very least, nowhere near as much as there very easily could have been. A great example is when he reveals his secret purpose to Durin, that he lied to him, that he was really here to get his mithril, the one thing that Durin seemed to be afraid that Elrond might do. Then Durin turns around and instead of confronting him and being really quite betrayed, says, Yeah, alright. Don't really care that you manipulated me, you can have it all then, mate. The many beats we got such as those are ripe for tense, compelling confrontations that make for great TV, and it was a potential that routinely went unrealised. When Elrond has his apprenticeship with Celebrimbor, he never struggles to please him. At no point does he face any kind of difficulty when working with him. Almost every scene he shares with the guy is conflict-free. The crying shame is that it would have been quite easy to write in, so Elrond is really getting on his nerves, and to make Celebrimbor one whisker away from firing Elrond and replacing him. I appreciate that not every scene needs to have conflict, and that's fair enough, but there comes a point where a story has so little conflict, where the suspense is so low that it becomes detrimental. Conflict is the lifeblood of story, and this show wasted many, many easy opportunities to inject some into Elrond's. Uh, he's also a fairly passive character. Time and time again, other people do all of the work for Elrond, as he just sits there like a lemon. Uh, when the mithril is being mined, Elrond just stands there watching as Durin does all of the hard work, and Durin is the only one thrusted into danger when there's a cave-in. When the king says the elves aren't getting none of our mithril, Durin does practically all of the hard work in trying to convince him to change his mind, while Elrond, again, just stands there like a lemon as passive as can be. 
You want to err on the side of having an active protagonist over a passive one. Uh, this is for several reasons, but what I think's the biggest one is when a character's active, it means they're making many, many choices over the course of the story. And when a character makes choices, it demonstrates the flaws of their character, their dreams, their wounds, and I'd argue characters making choices is the best tool for characterization that exists. Nothing demonstrates a character's aspects better than the choices they make in a story, and Elrond made very, very few choices in this show. It was mostly people telling him what to do, then he just does it, or giving things to him with absolutely no struggle required on Elrond's part. Case in point, there was a moment in episode one when Elrond's speaking to the king, and then this happens. Are you acquainted with the work of Lord Celebrimbor? The greatest of Elven Smiths, of course. I've admired his artistry since I was a child. When I saw him say this, I paused the show with excitement to think it through, and my immediate reaction was more or less, oh my god, this is perfect. This is a fantastic thing to build a story around. You've just established that Elrond deeply admires Celebrimbor and secretly dreams of being his apprentice, and then you show him struggling so very, very hard to attain his lifelong dream of gaining this position. Oh my god, this is going to be wonderful. Just one wonderful as Elrond's main plot for season one. That's at least what I thought at the time. Then I resumed the clip, and uh, this happened. Why do you ask? He is about to embark on a new project, one of singular importance, and we've decided that you will be working with him. But I'll allow you to explain the details, Lord Celebrimbor. No! What did you do? Y you maniacs! You nincompoops! Do you even understand what you just did? Like, this idea has all of the ingredients you need to make a wonderful protagonist. Every ingredient you could possibly want was here, ripe for the picking. Instead, you introduce the idea that he's Elrond's hero, and in the same scene, literally ten seconds later, you have him effortlessly gain an apprenticeship under the guy he worships. This is such a waste of storytelling potential, it's unbelievable. Here's what I reckon episode one really should have been. Uh, they clearly establish that Elrond has a deep longing in his life. He's working a job that's quite dull and not challenging him. He's just feeling quite dead inside as he's uh, transcribing a scroll or something tedious. But then he overhears that Celebrimbor, his hero, is in town working on his new top secret project. And Elrond finally has a spark in his eye as he sees an opportunity to throw aside his dull job in administration and live his secret dream of being a master craftsman, to make things of beauty. Uh, so Elrond all excitedly tells his friends and family, tomorrow I'm going to ask Celebrimbor if I can be his apprentice. What do you guys think? And they all say, well that's wonderful darling, but you've got to have realistic goals. Celebrimbor hasn't taken an apprentice in 150 years. He's hardly going to take someone now, and if he did, it wouldn't be you. All of a sudden, we couldn't care more about Elrond's journey, because he actually has relatable wants and dreams right from the word go, which is something no character in the show can boast. So Elrond, disheartened by the words of his friends and family, bats their doubts away and tries to court Celebrimbor, but the man says, no, I don't want an apprentice, I have zero interest, like, it's far too time consuming and I'm far too busy. And Elrond reacts like he's been punched in the gut and he goes back home uh, deflated and defeated. But then he sees his sword he made a while back, realising it's proof of his skill. Like, why didn't I bring it the first time? I'm such an idiot, he thinks. So he tries again in a later scene, and in a time where it's inappropriate in a way that breaks social customs and tradition, uh, much to the judgement of his peers, all of whom are watching him do this. And he tries to convince Celebrimbor again, saying that he won't be a nuisance, he has plenty of experience with a forge, and look, he even made the sword last winter, what do you think? But then Celebrimbor takes the sword, looks at it and sighs, picking out the most unnoticeable nitpicks on why it's actually a rather flawed sword. It's good enough to kill an orc, but it's certainly not something one would brag about. Despite the fact it looks quite beautiful to us as an audience, to Celebrimbor and his highly refined eye, it's a rather mediocre sword. So he rejects Elrond again, saying, nope, sorry, you don't have the skill or experience to be my apprentice. 
Yes. And then we see Elrond's heart break even more as his all-time hero rejects him for a second time. And even worse, he gets turned down in front of a whole crowd, in front of his friends and family, validating their doubts of him, in front of the boss of his current job. E even the king is there to witness Killer Brimble both reject him and give a scathing critique of the sword that he was rather proud of. And so Elrond throws the sword away and just falls into a depression. His lifelong dream is over. He goes back to work in his dull, dull job, and my god, does he feel low. And then, one of his friends or family gives him a word of encouragement, an insightful word of wisdom of what Killer Brimble is truly looking for in an apprentice, and that gives him a burst of inspiration, and he comes up with this crazy new plan to not make something dull like a sword, but a really creative contraption. But Killer Brimble is about to leave town, and the window is closing, so he works his socks off for weeks, the deadline looming, getting closer and closer, and he presents it to the man at the very last second as he's leaving the town's gates. And Killer Brimble immediately sets off with a great number of critiques. This could be better, and you chose the wrong material for this part. Steel would have been a superior choice, and he goes on and on, pointing out its flaws. And again, we see Elrond's happiness die. But then Killer Brimble says, but it is creative and the design has potential, and he sighs and says, All right, one week. You have one week as my apprentice, and if I like you, I'll take you on. And Elrond bursts out with happiness. We have this major victory moment for him. But Celebrimbor says, very sternly, but you're on thin ice. You've got to prove yourself over the next week, because I'll be showing you the door otherwise. I have very high standards from what I expect from you. And then Elrond learns of the mysterious rings Celebrimbor's working on, his mysterious masterwork. And from here we practically get the same plot, only now it works so much better. Celebrimbor says he just doesn't have the manpower to get his masterpiece done in time. He needs this grand one-of-a-kind forge built in order to realise his designs. But he's on a deadline, he couldn't possibly get it built in time. And then Elrond proposes to Celebrimbor that the dwarves would be perfectly suited for this kind of work. Are you sure? asks Celebrimbor. This isn't the kind of job I imagine them being terribly suited for, and Elrond enthusiastically insists that the dwarves couldn't be more perfect. He oversells them to hell and back. And so when they both go to the dwarves and he gets shunned by the doorman, and then he turns to see Celebrimbor looking at him, very unimpressed. There's so much more tension now. And then later when he speaks to Durin and it goes badly, as tensions rise and Durin shouts at him, all the while Celebrimbor is there, just giving him this dry, unimpressed look. There is so much tension now. This is suddenly quite good TV, because now Elrond actually has stakes. There is actual suspense around him for once. He's a whisker away from losing his dream apprenticeship he's worked so hard to attain. And one wrong word, if he offends Durin, if he doesn't impress his very demanding master, he loses his dream and it's all over. Like, we could have had that be episode one of The Rings of Power. Like, that is the potential this idea has. But no, instead we rushed over Elrond seeking his dream job in the space of literally 20 seconds in the show. The thing is, the rewrite I just laid out is practically the same as what was in the show, it's just way more fleshed out. We still go along and include Durin and all that mithril, but look how compelling Elrond now is as a character. But why does that idea work? Well, Elrond now has a highly relatable motivation, to escape his humdrum daily life and live his dream. That is something that everyone everywhere can relate to on some level. He now has a dark night of the soul where his resolve is truly tested. This is something he and Galadriel never had in the show. There are also now very clear stakes of him losing his apprenticeship, meaning the suspense and conflict and tension is way higher for it. And correspondingly, he has to be very active, struggling tremendously in order to not lose the thing he cares about most. This plot has everything you need. That's why Elrond ticked me off. He wasn't a terrible character, but he was a terrible waste of potential. With just a few tweaks, he could have been a thoroughly engaging protagonist. But if you're looking for more Lord of the Rings content, Lindsay Ellis just came back from her hiatus and released a great 50 minute breakdown of how well the Lord of the Rings films adapted the original books. And if you want to watch that, as well as my Nebula exclusive video essay on world building, all you've got to do is click my link in the description 
and you'll get to watch them both immediately on Nebula. Plus, you'll get free access to Curiosity Stream in this two for one deal. It's only $14.79 a year for both. It's so cheap, it's ridiculous. But anyway, thanks for watching. Click my link in the description, and I'll see you guys next time on The Closer Look.